The best way to describe the New York Mets walk-off victory against the Nationals on Monday is to say that they simply survived. And in doing so, they got a leg up in the NL wildcard race. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, I'll tell you what. I was in Washington at the beginning of this incredible run for the New York Mets, where they won that series, where they swept that series against the Nationals at the beginning of June. And my dad and I walked out of the ballpark for the first two games of that series, frustrated, despite the Mets' victory, because there was bullpen meltdowns. Luckily, the team held on. That's the way I would describe this game. Tonight, it was one of the most frustrating games I've watched all season because without Francisco Lindor in the starting lineup, this offense just could not hit. Now, I'm usually the one that tries to push back on Mets fan frustration. I try to be the forever optimist. I try to look at the other team like I did over the weekend. I said, look, you know, the Mets had an opportunity to win both of those games that they lost to the Phillies but the Phillies did a great job and they executed better than the Mets and they just proved that they're the better team this year. And that's all fine and well. And I could say today that Jake Irvin was lights out because he was. We have seen what Jake Irvin can do to the Mets. We saw it on the 4th of July when he went eight scoreless. He just shut down the Braves in his last start. He is a young pitcher that really could be a frontline guy for the Nationals for years to come. And he was sensational in this start tonight. Retired the side in order in six of his seven innings. But that doesn't make it any less frustrating to watch as a Mets fan. And there was only one inning where the New York Mets threatened against Irving. As I just mentioned, retired the side in order in six of his seven frames. That was the fourth inning when Jose Iglesias got a leadoff single. Then with two outs after that, Pete Alonso gets an infield single. Brandon Nimmo draws a walk to load the bases. Mark Vientos comes up with the bases juiced. He hits a chopper down the third baseline that I thought for sure he was going to beat out. It's one of those balls that was just placed perfectly. Nobody should have been able to make that play. But Irvin himself comes off the mound, fires, and gets Vientos out at first base. And it was just incredible how long it took Vientos to get down the line. There's one thing to say about Mark Vientos. Man, is not fleet of foot. Outside of maybe J.D. Martinez, I don't think there's a player on this team that Vientos beats in a foot race, honestly. And I would venture to guess that most of the pitchers would probably beat him too. I mean, he's slow. He's really slow. Uh, definitely your prototypical slugger. But, man, I, 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 like, I really wonder how much quicker Pete Alonzo would be in a foot race against Mark Vientos because he makes – Pete Alonzo look like, I don't even know, Billy Hamilton out there. It's crazy. But that was a really frustrating moment because you thought the Mets were going to get on the board and they just couldn't do it. So to stay in that game, it was going to take great pitching. And once again, Sean Mania delivered. This is why the Mets are keeping him on regular rest on the stretch. They have made it clear who their ace is and they're trying to ride him all the way to the finish line. And honestly, tonight I thought that maybe well, pulled him a little bit early. He was at 85 pitches through seven strong innings, and they pulled him. But I think that was to set him up for the final two starts of the season for him, which are going to be massive, one against the Phillies, one against the Braves. So I think that was the thought process there. Had Jose Budo ready to go for the eighth inning, and he did have a great frame, struck out the side. But it's Manaya that deserves the MVP of this game for really keeping the Mets in it. The only inning where he gives up a run is the fourth inning, leadoff double, and then a run eventually scores on an RBI single. But other than that, he was just brilliant. Third inning, right before that fourth, he gave up a leadoff hit. Then there was a bunt base hit that put two runners on with no outs. 
Emanaya pitched his way out of that jam, got a pop up. Eddie Alvarez nearly turned an unbelievable double play with Jose Iglesias, flashing up the middle, backhand, glove toss. Iglesias somehow touches the bag, coming across as fast as he could, but just barely uh, the runner beat it out. And then, um, you know, it ends up being a situation there where you have James Wood up with a runner on third base and Manai gets a big strike out to get out of that jam. But overall, again, Sean Manai are brilliant. We'll talk about him a little bit more in the final segment. Budo strong eighth inning. Jake Irvin goes back out for the eighth inning, unlike Manaya. And Tyrone Taylor, again, coming up clutch, greets him with a leadoff double. After the home run he hit on Sunday, and now this double, to me, I'd be starting Tyrone Taylor down the stretch. I really would. Harrison Bader has had his moments, but he's not swinging it that well. Tyrone Taylor should be the guy in center field or in right when you don't have Starling Marte out there or Jesse Winker because he's delivering right now. That was a huge hit in this game. Honestly, probably the biggest hit, even bigger than Marte's walk-off because it came against Irvin and he wasn't able to get through that eighth. After the big hit by Taylor, Francisco Alvarez hits a soft grounder originally it was ruled an infield hit replay review called Alvarez out, but that put Taylor on third base. Irvin is pulled. Who's dude up Eddie Alvarez, which was the perfect guy to come up in that spot for just the state of the Mets right now. No Jeff McNeil. So that would have been your starting second baseman in a spot like this without Lindor, but instead it's Alvarez and obviously no Lindor. So here comes Eddie Alvarez and you wonder who's on the bench to pinch it for him. I miss DJ Stewart in that moment. As sad as that is, I was like, man, if DJ Stewart was still on this team right now, maybe he could be the one to hit a sack fly. I don't know. You looked at the bench. You had Luis Terrence, your backup catcher, you had Harrison Bader, and Luis at Helicuna. So I thought, all right, here comes Eddie Alvarez. He had good numbers in the minor leagues this year. Here's his moment. <laughs> but no, Starling Marte was actually available. A couple days removed from getting drilled in the forearm on Sunday comes in off the bench, has a terrible at-bat. First pitch swinging on a sinker that was in on his hands, rolls it over. So I was frustrated with Marte then, but he certainly made up for it in his next at-bat. But the Mets still had to tie the game up. And Jose Iglesias comes up with that runner on third base, two outs, and this is the situation that we have seen Iglesias come through in time after time. On this season prior to this at-bat, Jose Iglesias with 10 for 22 with the runner in scoring position and two outs. 10 for 22. It's damn near 500. Well, once again, Iglesias comes through, delivers a hit, makes it 11 for 23 now in the season. Rips one right back at Derek Law, 104 miles per off, off the bat. Law tries to field it, deflects it, ball ends up in no man's land. Iglesias beats it out without a throw. Taylor comes in to score. Tie ball game. Amazing, right? And when Diaz comes on to pitch the ninth inning after the Mets failed to score a run, I will or score another run. Jesse Winker had followed up that at bat with a walk. And then JD Martinez had a brutal at bat to end the inning where he chased two sliders out of the zone to fall behind 0 and 2. Looked at a couple pitches to get even, but then struck out looking on a fastball that was low. And I thought it was a ball, but still way too close to take. And again, you're seeing one of these Mets hitters just not come through. So it's on to the ninth. And when Diaz pitches, gives up a leadoff single. That was to James Wood. James Wood steals second base. So now Diaz is pitching with a runner on second, nobody out. He did a great job to get through that inning. And I think it's worth noting that Luis and Helicuna came into the game for Jesse Winker as Marte's spot in the lineup, pinch hitting for Alvarez, was two spots ahead of Winker. So Winker comes out, Marte stays in. And Acuna comes on to play shortstop with Iglesias sliding over to second base. And Acuna has to play the premium position with the game on the line. And he came through because the ball found him. He made the first two plays cleanly. It's not like these were incredible plays. He didn't make a diving stop or anything. But you're talking about a 22-year-old rookie with two games of big league experience under his belt who is being thrown into a tie ball game ninth inning where his team has to avoid giving up a run and he did his job and made it look easy. So that was a good sign for sure. Edwin Diaz ends up with a runner on third base, two outs after those ground outs, and he gets the big strikeout to get out of the inning. 
You had the bottom of the ninth and your best three hitters, so to speak, coming up. The guys that are supposed to pick up the slack for Lindor. That's Pete Alonzo, Brendan Nemo, and Mark Fientos. I'll tell you what, Pete Alonzo leading off that inning, he is making it way easier than I ever thought it would be for Mets fans to say goodbye to him at the end of this season. And I hate to say it that bluntly, but man, he's having a rough year. He just got blown up by fastballs. Granted, a very good fastball from that left-handed leader for the Nationals. Can't remember his name. There was some F, some R's. Ferrer, Ferrar. Uh, he threw like a Ferrari. Threw real hard. But man, Pete Alonso got nothing but fastballs, and he strikes out on granted a 99 mile per hour fastball, but one right down the middle. And Pete was just beat bad. Nimmo comes up. He gets jammed. I'll give him a little bit of credit. I mean, he did put bat on ball and hit one to the outfield, but it just died because it was a pitch that was in on his hands. Vientos has the best at bat of the three, works a full count, and then does hit one hard to center field, exit velocity over 100 miles per hour, but he just got under it, so he flies out. We're on to extra innings. Tenth inning, Reed Garrett comes on with the ghost runner, standing on second base. First batter, sacrifice bunt, so runners on third, one out. Garrett gets two ground balls to Acuna. Acuna on the first one, able to hold that runner at third, make the play, and then again, another one hit right to him with two outs. Much easier, and the Mets survive that inning, come to the bottom half, tie ball game. All you got to do is get that runner in for a second, from second, and Carlos Mendoza, very aggressive. He goes to Harrison Bader to pinch run, and pull Vientos out of the game because Vientos made the final out. He was the ghost runner. In doing so, there was no more infielders. So we found out after the game, if it went to an 11th, Luis Torrens was going to have to play some second base. And Mendoza said, I've seen him play second before. So I guess that's something that he knew from his Yankees days. But still, very aggressive stuff there to empty your bench or really empty your infield right there by having already subbed that Alvarez and now subbing out Vientos, but you needed speed there. Francisco Alvarez comes up after Tyrone Taylor was intentionally walked to set up a double play. Alvarez hits a fly ball to deep right field. His at-bats have been getting better, so that's a good sign. That allows the runner to advance the third. And then here comes Starling Marte. And Marte did a much better job in his second at-bat, was not overly anxious, kept the bat on his shoulder, looked at a strike one, but continued to take pitches, worked a three and one count where he knew he was going to get something to hit. He did not miss it. Ripped a line driving to left field at 109 miles per hour. And it is an easy walk off victory as Bader scores without the ball even being fielded. Would have been a double had it not ended the game. Stalling Marte delivers for the Mets and they walk it off by a score of two to one. Like I said in the cold open, they survived this game, survived it. But great pitching good defense, and a couple of timely hits by Iglesias and Marte, as well as the leadoff double in the eighth by Tyrone Taylor. And the New York Mets won a game while the Braves and the Diamondbacks lost. I want to talk about what else happened in the NL wildcard race in the next segment. Also, I'll give you your proper update on Francisco Lindor. How do the Mets get through the rest of this series without him? Who will step up? We'll touch on that a little bit in the next segment. First, though, quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections. You watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. So you could turn $10 into $1,000. This weekend, maybe you're looking at the NFL slate. You like Tyree Kill's yards. So you might go more on 90 and a half yards. Maybe you like Aaron Jones. Maybe you like Malik Neighbors. Whoever you like, you can add them to your prize picks entry. You could play across different sports. So you can look at NFL and MLB on the same entry. Try to combine them to win big. Run your game on prize picks. Prize picks is the best way to win real money this football season. Which players are going off, which aren't. Make your picks in less than 60 seconds and turn your sports opinions into real money all season long on prize picks. Download the prize picks app today. Use the code locked on MLB 
You're going to get $50 instantly when you play five. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive that $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize picks, run your game. If you were looking for instant reaction tonight after the Mets walked off the Nationals in this game, you now have a home for that with the Locked On Podcast Network, and that is the Locked On New York Sports YouTube channel. Head over there and subscribe. This is going to be your home for every post-game show when it comes to New York sports. So Mets, Jets, Giants, Yankees, all of it is there for you right now at Locked On New York Sports. So go over there, subscribe. You will find that show on our podcast feed on the audio side as well, labeled as a postcast. It's just an audio home for it. Locked on Mets. Still going to go exactly how it has all season long and for years before this. My show is not changing. It's just an additional show to give you more Mets content so you can subscribe on YouTube. Uh, And also, do me a favor here. If you're watching on YouTube today, subscribe to the Locked on Mets YouTube channel. The goal is to get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the season. So I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. All right, let's talk about the NL wildcard race now because the Mets gained a game on both the Braves and the Diamondbacks tonight, which shows you how important it was that they were able to survive and hold on to this game as the Braves lost to the Dodgers by a score of 9 to nothing. So after winning the first two games of their four-game set, the Dodgers ultimately even into a four-game split between those two teams and the Mets able to regain that one-game lead in the NL wildcard race. Meanwhile. The Diamondbacks were playing the Rockies in Colorado. They jump out to a 2-0 lead in the first inning. If you're like me, I turned the game off after that. I, I, I wasn't really paying attention, I should say, after that. I wasn't really keyed in. But I checked in, bottom of the seventh inning. Oh, the Rockies just scored. Tied it up. Turned it on, watched the end, and I was very happy I did. Brenton Doyle got a leadoff hit in the bottom of the ninth inning of that tie game. Stole second base. The uh, Diamondbacks chose to intentionally walk Ryan McMahon, all-star for them this year. So you had runners at first and second, nobody out for Brendan Rodgers. He hits a double play ball to Cattell Marte, who delivers a perfect feed to the shortstop Geraldo Perdomo, who, by the way, started over, not started, but got Lindor's spot in the all-star game last year. Not that I haven't let go of it or anything. Uh, Perdomo, though, on the double play, makes a terrible throw to first. And that error allows Doyle to score. Rockies walk it off on the error. And the Mets are now just one game back of Arizona in the wildcard race for that second spot. And if the Rockies have a little more magic in them, it could get even closer. And then over the weekend, the Diamondbacks had to go into Milwaukee for a four-game set after nearly getting swept the prior weekend. So this race is close. The Mets have to just handle their own business. The one team, though, that's pulling away day by day is the Padres, who now won four in a row. They beat the Astros tonight. They're now three and a half games back of the Dodgers in the NL West and three and a half games up on the Diamondbacks in the wild card. So even though the Mets won ugly, they still won, and they're once again sitting in the driver's seat with one of these playoff spots with 12 games left to go. they got to take advantage of the Nationals for the rest of this series, though. And they will not have Francisco Lindor to do it. The Mets got good news, though. This is not bad news. This was best case scenario, honestly. I would have been stunned if Lindor was in the starting lineup tonight. Stunned. MRI showed that there was no structural damage to his back. There obviously is still some stuff going on there, some muscle issue, but he's fine. It's just a waiting game. So right now, the timetable is two to three days or three to five days, depending on how he heals, basically. And I said it on yesterday's show. I said it on Twitter. What the Mets had to do in this situation after they pulled him on Sunday was basically give him the national series off, give him three days of rest, basically look at it as you got 72 hours, actually a little bit more than that, to get him ready for first pitch against the Phillies on Friday. So we'll see. We'll see, or excuse me, on Thursday. Um, We'll see if he's available for that. If not, maybe it's one of those games over the weekend. I think the best thing about this is Lindor should be there for that Brave series, but hopefully he's going to be there for the Phillies one as well. And we'll see, is this Lindor at 75%, 80%, 90%, 
that we won't know until we actually watch them on the field. And you never know. There could always be a setback. But for now, the Mets got good news. They're going to play this safe here. We'll see how he does with some rest. Hopefully, Francisco Lindor can be himself for the final 10 games of the season. In the meantime, it's going to be Luis and Acuna starting the final two games of the series against the Nationals. The reason why you saw Eddie Alvarez get the start tonight, and I believe I mentioned this on yesterday's show that I was expecting this, is because you had a righty on the mound in Jake Irvin. And if you look at their minor league numbers this year, Eddie Alvarez was a better hitter in the same league than Luis and Acuna. With that said, I think that Acuna is the better defensive alignment for the Mets because Iglesias is better at second than he is at shortstop. And Acuna is a better shortstop than Iglesias. So now you have Acuna starting against two lefties in this series, and we'll see what he gives you. I wouldn't expect Acuna to pick up Lindor offensively, but can he do it defensively? So far, so good. And again, to be put to have been thrown into this game tonight in the ninth inning of a tie ball game and to make four of the final six outs for the Mets. That's a great sign that this kid's not going to be phased. And I've talked all year about the fact that Acuna is the type of player that can thrive in a bench role, particularly in a postseason setting. And I thought he was going to be the September call up on September 1st. It didn't happen, but now he's here and he's going to be the guy down the stretch to fill in whenever you need someone to replace Lindor because of this back injury. But also, I think he'd be the guy that would make a postseason roster, be able to play second short center field. He's eligible because he's been on the 40-man roster all year. So Acuna is going to be a big part of this team down the stretch. And it's exciting. It's exciting because he's still a top prospect. And you never know what can happen. It does seem like his heart rate is pretty slow in these big moments. So maybe he's a guy that might thrive on the big stage. And if so, he could have a really big role in this series. Now, to replace Lindor offensively, though, it's going to take the other guys. And Iglesias has done an amazing job first filling in and taking over the everyday role when Jeff McNeil went down. And now having to play some shortstop, too, and taking over the leadoff spot. Iglesias has been unbelievable all year, but particularly lately. He's on a 10-game hitting streak, and four of them have been multi-hit games. He has the exact same batting average on the season as Luis Arise, who's in line to win the batting title at 323. Remember, this is a career 281 hitter. In his last season, which was not in 2023, he didn't play in the big leagues last year. In 2022, he played for the Rockies and he hit 292. So hitting for an average is something he's always done, but baseball has moved away from guys like Jose Iglesias, guys who don't have much slug in their bat. And we know Iglesias doesn't, even with the weighted ball training and all this stuff that they talked about, you know, that he did with JD Martinez in Syracuse. He has three home runs. He's not a guy that's going to drive the baseball with a ton of authority, although he is getting base hits by hitting the ball hard on the ground and hitting line drives. But what Iglesias is doing is just putting together good at bat for good at bat for good at bat. He's playing great defense, so many big plays in the field. He's a great clubhouse presence. And he's coming through in the clutch better than anybody else on this team. So again, baseball has moved away from guys like him because he is the guy that hits for a high average and plays good defense. And in the past, that guy would be your starting shortstop or your starting second baseman. He would bat second a lot of times, and he would just be tasked with moving the runners over, laying down bunts. It was a different game when I was a kid even, okay? I'm talking about, I think of, for some reason, it's the Marlins for me, 2003. That was the first world series team that I watched very closely because I live in South Florida and my dad took me to a playoff game in each of those series. And that team had Juan Pierre and Luis Castillo and Iglesias is very much a Castillo type player, but you know, a better defender. I would say because Castillo was pretty good at second base too. So maybe I shouldn't um, knock him, but you know, when I say Luis Castillo, we all think of the drop pop up, but regardless this is a guy that baseball doesn't value anymore. And the Mets signed him on a minor league deal. And he has been everything to this team. And honestly, he's having a career year. 808 OPS would be the best season of his career outside of 2020 short and sample size. Where he posted a 956 OPS and batted 373 for the Baltimore Orioles. But this has been a remarkable season for him. And honestly, if you list off the guys in their first year with the Mets this year, 
Sean and I, Luis Severino, Harrison Bader, Tyrone Taylor is technically going to come back anyway. Uh, JD Martinez of all those guys outside of Manaya, I don't think there's anyone you would want back more than Iglesias. I think he's the most likely to come back next year because there's no reason for the Mets not to give this guy, you know, $4 million to come back and, and play a utility bench role again. No reason not to do it. And I'm sure he'd love to come back. So uh, it's been awesome to see him really deliver. He's got to step up in these spots here. And you need the guys that we talked about in yesterday's show. Alonzo, Nimmo, J.D. Martinez, Mark Vientos. These guys got a hit. And hopefully the Mets can do that against a couple lefties with Washington over the next few days. And maybe they can actually sweep this series. Um, but part of that is going to come down to the starting pitching. And that's where I want to close the show. We'll talk a little bit about Sean Maniah, but just how – this rotation is what is carrying them. It's no longer the offense. I'll go through that in just a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little bit different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a the YouTube TV base plan, You'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon at a market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. If you're an everyday listener to the show, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where you get updates from me anytime news breaks on the Mets. You can ask me questions anytime, take part in our Locked On Mets signed photo giveaways, and you get the lineup graphic sent to your phone each day so you know who's in the starting lineup without ever having to go on social media. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find the link in the episode description with subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. Looking at the time, I've gone a little bit long today, but you know what? We're in the stretch run here, and I want to talk about this starting rotation because, for one, Sean Maniah has become a legit ace for this team. Among qualified starters in the National League, Maniah is sixth in ERA at 3.26, he is ninth in innings pitched at 171. That's one behind Luis Severino. He's got a 1.08 whip, which is the fifth best mark, one point behind Sonny Gray and one point better than Dylan Cease. And his opponent batting average against is the second best in the National League throughout this entire season to only Zach Wheeler. That is legit a stuff. I've said it before. I'll say it again. He is going to get Cy Young votes. Is he going to win? Of course not. But is he going to be somewhere between, I don't know, 5 and 10? He, he'll get some down ballot votes for sure this year, which is insane. No one expected this from Sean Manaya, And he's been even better as the season has worn on since the All-Star break. In 12 starts, he leads the National League in batting average against and in whip and in innings pitch and in starts. He's one strikeout behind Blake Snell for the league lead, and that's because he's made two additional starts in Snell. but. He has been on a tear, and over his last 10 starts, Manaya has completed seven innings six times. Did that again tonight. He's gone six and two-thirds three times, and then there was the one bad start he had against Seattle where he was knocked out after three innings pitched. But in September, he's got a 190 ERA. This guy has been nails. That's why he has been their ace. That's why they're going to rely on him to pitch against the Phillies and then turn right back around on regular rest to start against the Braves in that pivotal three-game series that will likely decide the Mets' playoff fate. They are going to rely on this guy, and that would also set him up. The Mets are fortunate enough to make the playoffs for a game one wild card start again on regular rest. He's been everything to them, but also you've had Luis Severino, David Peterson, Jose Quintana really just delivering as well. Actually, sorry, one quick stat that I forgot to mention. It's my favorite one on Shamanaya. We talk about it after every start. The Mets record when he takes the hill this year is now 22 and 8. And in the last 15 starts that he's had, the Mets are 13 and 2. So that's why they're trying to run him out there a lot down the stretch here. But as we look at where this rotation turns to next, it's on Tyler McGill to step up. I don't think I mentioned the latest update we had on Paul Blackburn, but it's some weird spinal tap leak. David Stern said this was an injury that's not typical for baseball players. Uh, there's just no timetable on him to come back. I would not necessarily expect him to pitch for the Mets until the playoffs or maybe against the Brewers, if anything. So 
This is McGill's spot in the rotation now, and he did have a great start against the Blue Jays, uh, where he went six scoreless, struck out nine last week. Now he's got to deliver against the Nationals, so we'll see how he does. Then it's going to be Jose Quintana, who I did a show about after his start against the Orioles on August 20th, where he gave up seven runs. And it was a show where I talked about why the Mets were stuck with Jose Quintana in the rotation because there was no way they were going to DFA him. He hadn't been that bad on the year, at least. His ERA had gone from 3.95 to 4.57 over a stretch where he had allowed 19 runs across four starts. Well, since I did that show, he has gone and allowed just one run over his last four starts and has lowered his ERA back down to 3.91. So the Mets are going to need McGill and Quintana, their two back end starters, to step up to win, if not sweep this series against the Nationals. Then against the Phillies. You go right back to Severino and Peterson, who put the Mets in position to win, or, well, nearly, I would say, on the final two games of that series in Philadelphia over the weekend. They're going to go right back and face them again. And then you'll have Manai pitch that game three on Saturday, probably McGill on Sunday, but because Quintana's spot in the rotation is going to be skipped in that Brave series, there's an off day on Monday, so is going to pitch. You could go to Quintana on three days rest or some combo of the two of them, McGill and Quintana, uh, to close out that Philly series. Then you got your horses, Sevy, Peterson, and I against the Braves. And the final series of the season, it would be some combination of Quintana, McGill, and probably Severino in a game 162 if it matters. So that's where we're at. And in June and July, this was a team that relied on the bats to take them all the way back into the race. I've said at times the bats have to be the ones that get the Mets into the playoffs, but this rotation is proving me wrong because it's those guys that keep the Mets in each of these games where you're not getting a lot of offense, but if you get just enough down the stretch, you're able to win like the Mets did tonight. Hopefully they can win more lopsided in the final two games of this series, but regardless, it's a game-by-game situation here for the New York Mets. 12 games left. A game up on the Braves, a game back on the Diamondbacks, four teams gunning for three spots. Really, it started to look more like three teams gunning for two spots. It's going to be fun down the stretch, but it's also going to be stressful if it goes the other way. I will be here with you every single day down the stretch as we have been for months now. The Mets win. We'll be here to celebrate. If they lose, I'm here to put you on the therapy couch and talk you down. Hopefully, all of this ends in a playoff berth. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you are listening on the audio side, follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, again, do me a favor. Hit that big red subscribe button. The goal is to get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the season. So I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked on Mets your first listener, your first watch every day. Not for your second watch. Head over to YouTube and check out the first ever 24-7 streaming channel. Covers everything in the world of sports. Talking about Locked On Sports today with your local host from each team, league-wide host from each league. Find Locked On Sports today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube.